You're listening to eLearn Chat, where talk is knowledge. Hello and welcome to eLearn Chat, our new podcast featuring prominent leaders, shakers and movers in the e-learning and training industry. Your co-hosts are Rick Zanotti and Terrence Wing. Hi, everyone. Welcome to eLearn Chat. I'm Rick Zanotti, and this is episode number 27. And uh, joining me today, as always, is our co-host, the inimicable, Terrence Wing. Hey, Terrence. Hey, Rick. How you doing today? I'm good. Well, that is good to hear. We got another great guest on the show today. We've got uh, Stevie Rocco from you just have to say her name like that stevie rocco <laughs> you can't you can't just say stevie rocco it's just or for those of you that know her on twitter uh stevie er s-t-e-v-i-e-r yeah just that s-t-e-v-i-e-r stevie er and uh, that's because um she's not quite the steviest but she's definitely stevie er I took that joke from her so sorry to use your own joke i probably didn't do it justice uh for you stevie but uh, telling you a little bit about Stevie, she is a, uh, a learning designer and fixed-term faculty member at the greatest uh, college on the face of the earth. That would be Penn State. And if you haven't noticed, I have my, my Penn State paraphernalia on today just for, for Stevie as well as my, my Penn State cup. So if you're uh, a Penn Stater out there, be sure to give Stevie a shout out. Um, but most of us have probably met Stevie at an ASTD conference. Uh, she does a, a lot of uh, uh, discussions about tools that are available, that are, are free and open source, and that can really uh, stimulate and enhance learning. So without any further ado, let me introduce Stevie. How are you, Stevie? I am well. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. And looks like we got your Facebook fan page popped up there. Great. <laughs> <laughs> or your profile page, I think it was. There we yeah. go. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Which and I don't think. Let me look on your your Twitter thing here for a second. But I think your no your your Twitter avatar is still the same one, right? Yes. Yeah. I just yeah. changed the the Facebook one recently. Because if you ever look at at Stevie's avatar, you're you have to just say to yourself, "There's a woman that's just having the greatest time." So even when she sends a tweet out <laughs> that she's mad about something, you look at the avatar and she's like, "Oh, she's just the happiest person on the planet." <laughs> <laughs> Happy is good. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, Stevie, tell us a little bit about what you do over at, at uh, Penn State. Well, I uh, do learning design for uh, our undergraduate program in energy and sustainability policy. And I help faculty members sort of create fully online courses and course experiences for students who take them at a distance. So our students are all over the world. Lots of them are in the military. And this op affords them an opportunity to get a degree. So it's really interesting stuff. We get to look at lots of neat technologies and things. Sounds great. What kind of tools do you develop in? Um, we use a content management system called Drupal. Okay. And um, we also, you know, use kind of the Adobe suite for things, mm -hmm. uh, Flash. And we do some video as well, QuickTime. We use VoiceThread, uh, which is another tool, which is kind of interesting. And, you know, just... Just a, a whole host of things, depending on the course, really. We what's, try to fit it to what the course needs. What's VoiceThread? I haven't heard of that one. VoiceThread's really cool. It's a, it's a, a voice annotation device. So uh, you can put up a slide and the professor can say something about it or they could, it could have a voiceover, sort of a PowerPoint thing. And then people can annotate and make comments on it uh, in the VoiceThread. So it becomes a threaded discussion, but audio. Interesting. So, yeah, it's really interesting. And you can do it by having uh, recording it on your computer. You can even have the system call your cell phone and record okay. it that way, which is kind of cool. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing all the, the, the free stuff that's out there. You know, it, it really takes away the excuses because most of the time we're, uh, you know, we used to make the excuse that we can't do it because, it, you know, the, the cost is Intensive. inhibitive. But you know, now I can't think of many things, uh, especially dealing with media, that we can't do um, because the technology is a uber accessible at, at, at worst. Also, the good thing, being in education, you get good pricing on the Adobe Suites. Yes, we do. 
<laughs> a lot better. Yeah. Yes, that's making nice, us jealous. I was say. So today we brought you on to talk about two things. We brought you on to talk about accessibility and to talk about um, Creative Commons, uh, both challenges that learning designers, whether e-learning or whether instructor-led training, but probably more so on the e-learning side we'll talk about today, we face that some of the obstacles of, of both accessibility and Creative Commons just probably mostly out of a lack of, of foresight and preparation. I know I can say at least personally that every issue with those that I've had um, has been, you know, through a lack of, of preparation and, you know, foreseeing that this e-learning course could be taken by somebody who, um, you know, had a, a hearing impairment or something, you know, along those lines. So tell me a little bit about how you're, you're navigating that, Stevie. Yeah, we're really on our sort of initial stages of looking at accessibility as a whole at the university. There have been some groups that have worked on it um, on their own and briefly to try to do things in their own pockets. But now I think we're, we're trying as a, as a university to do some more comprehensive addressing of how will we meet, you know, Section 508 compliance, which is what we're required to meet as a semi-public institution. So... You know, we try to we try to start with the low hanging fruit. Um, we're trying to understand sort of the accessibility guidelines, and the W three C is really excellent for that. They have lots of resources. They have tutorials. They have samples. They have checklists. So that's been really really helpful. But the the key thing, and I think Terrence said it earlier, is that doing it up front is really been the key for us. Um, not waiting until you need it necessarily for everything. Now for some of the larger things like uh, closed captioning of a of a, an Illuminate Live session, for example, we actually have found a company to contract to do those things so that students who need closed captioning can actually participate in those live sessions. But for things that are just your basics, um, anything that's on the web, you know, we, we try to make sure that we have alternative text for images that don't just say, you know, the logo, but actually describes what you would be seeing, you know, man on boat or whatever, whatever the picture is of. So just having that kind of stuff in there and taking care of headers and checking your keyboard input, like trying to navigate through your stuff just using your keyboard and not your mouse, it's actually a little harder than you'd expect it to be. It, it can be, especially with a lot of the tools. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. So it, it opens your eyes if you unplug your mouse or you know get to a computer that doesn't have one or turn off your touchpad or whatever, and then try to do it just with the keyboard. It's it's an interesting experience. So is a lot of this done with meta tagging, where you meta tag the um, the images and everything else that's on a screen? Just, you know, as I'm developing, when I put an image in, I immediately, that's the first thing I do is put the alt tag mm -hmm. in because if I were to wait until later and do them all at once, I know it would never happen. So it's fast enough while I'm already inserting the image into the, into the object, into the web page for me to just add the alt tag right then. So I just kind of do it as I go. Um, and then when I come across things that it hasn't been taken care of, so for example, tables are a real problem for a lot of places. Um, because if you think of a table, if you're using it for, you know, tabular information, so you've got this table, right, you've got rows and columns, a screen reader that reads that table may not know, if you don't designate it correctly, whether to read across, whether to read down. Um, and so if you can imagine listening to that table and just read every row straight across, it can be really disorienting for people. So just putting simple header tags in your tables, you know, takes care of that. It lets the screen reader know how to read it. Right. And unfortunately, I've been involved with the visually impaired forum in the past and with uh, the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And it's amazing. A lot of the readers out there, like JAWS, are pretty good, but they're very expensive. And yeah. they sort of read most things, but they have issues with, with some things. And <clears throat> Surprisingly, some of the Microsoft accessibility options, the the Apple accessibility options aren't that bad. They're pretty good. And they're free. They come with the operating system. Right. So VoiceOver works really nicely in Safari. And it's a good way and, and a quick way to sort of test pages. Um, and for Windows, there's a NVDA is free and something called Thunder. And actually, if you go to Wikipedia, there's a full list of 
of screen readers and it tells you whether they're commercial, whether they're free, you know, where to get them right. and it kind of compares them. So it's a good That's place good. for people to start if they're interested in even just hearing it. Now it's interesting because uh, this is a, a subject near and dear to me in a lot of ways, but 508 compliance is, is interesting because a lot of times it's implemented incorrectly or for the wrong reasons, for the wrong audience. But what, I think before we even get to 508 compliance, have you noticed that there's a horrific amount of bad design? No <laughs> contrast, gray on gray. Uh, I, I, I constantly chastise Adobe for, for the kind of crappy interfaces they put out. Um, and I'm being, I'm being kind, they're crappy, that's kind. Uh, they're just <laughs> awful interfaces. Um, minute little buttons, uh, gray on gray, no contrast. You work on that eight hours straight, you will be tired. And, uh, and not to mention the ergonomics. Aside from 508, then you've got the problem where things are, maybe they're not always undockable and you're kind of tilting your head to got to get it. The bigger your monitor, the more you're going to be tilting sometimes to, to see things. And it's just an interesting aside that design has gotten so bad. It's either minuscule eight point or six point type on screens and, and just bad color combinations. Yeah, that's absolutely true. There's a, there's a really, a couple of really good sites that allow you to check the color um, you can check contrast. You can actually have it render your site uh, as if it would look to someone with red-green color blindness, which is actually really very common. Um, and so, you know, picking your color choices properly, getting the good contrast. And it doesn't just help people who actually have disabilities. Um, what they've discovered is people like me, as we age, um, you know, have a harder time distinguishing color contrast. So, right. you know, making it it have a better contrast and being really careful about those colors is, is good. It's good for everybody. It's not just good for someone with disabilities because the argument people give me is, well, we don't, you know, we'll deal with it if we ever have a student that has that problem. And it's like, well, it's not just good for them. It's good for everybody. So, you know, in that, in my mind, that means there's even better reasons to do it. I think you come up with a better learning experience. You do, and and if you don't have to struggle to figure out what the interface is doing, it's a lot easier for everybody, especially for the right. student. Well, I mean, there are four guidelines in the web content accessibility realm um, that things should be perceivable, that they should be operable, that they should be understandable, and that they should be robust. And none of those things are you know, completely out the door. Perceivable means if you don't put an alt tag on an image, that image becomes completely unable to be seen by the, by your user. Right. And, and so you need to make sure that they can see it in some way. You know, that it should be operable means, you know, you need keyboard input. You can't just trap somebody with a mouse because if somebody's losing, you know, people with arthritis lose fine motor skills. Sure. So you're going to have them try to carefully get through this, you know, crowded interface to that little tiny button. Um, you know, it's that's not really useful. The key for me, though, is the understandable you know, chunking up content, making sure that it's written in a way that's understandable to the majority of your, to, well, to everybody. Um, to me, that just makes it a better learning experience, really. You know? We have a, a question from Dawn. Okay. Um, and I think you, my first question, that she, has, she has two questions. Uh, the first one she was asking, is there, the, is there a best instructional design program out there that deals with, with accessibility better than others? And I'll let you answer that first one first. And then the second one, I'm not quite sure. I don't know a lot about this site that she's talking about, but she's asking, um, is Bobby still a good web page preview page for accessibility? So I'm not mm -hmm. sure what Bobby is. Bobby is, a, is exactly what she said it is. It's a web page okay. to preview for accessibility. Um, let me start with the first question. Um, I think that enhanced training across the board for instructional designers would be a useful thing because, first of all, the W3C does a good job. They're, it's their web accessibility initiative group that does this, and they do a pretty good job at trying to make it understandable, but there's a lot of stuff on the site and because their technical documentation is in the same place as their tutorials, sometimes it can be a little hard to find. Um, so yes, I think instructional designers need to at least get a handle around this in some way. Um, I don't know what software would be great at it. I don't think that there's probably anything that's perfect. I think there's there are a lot of things that help uh, you to do things. So for example, in our content management system, we use Drupal, which is an open source content management system. 
um, when you insert an image, it reminds you to put the put the alt tag in. And if you don't, it says, are you sure you don't want to? So, I mean, it sort of puts in sort of that level of safety to try to get you in the habit, you know, kind of thing. Okay. Uh, so it forces and, that so, consistency, too. Pardon me? It forces the consistency, too, which is nice. It does. And, you know, it, it, what's the old saying? It takes a month to make a habit. So, you know, you just kind of have to to really try. Um, I agree with Dawn in that the W3C is tough if you're new to this. There are a couple of places where, you know, in the if you click on the accessibility link, as soon as you get into the W3C, it takes you to the WAI site. And then um, the getting started section is is actually not too bad. It's pretty good. But again, it's there's so much there. It's kind of easy to get lost and go, you know, where's that page I saw before? So I agree with her. There's just there's just so much there that it's easy to get lost. Now, you're making a good point, too, because as we do get older, um, you're right, the sharpness in the vision just isn't there. Some people are exceptions, but, you know, after 40s, about 45, you know, you start getting the presbyopia, so people's arms have to get a little bit longer just to try to reach. Your, right. Yeah, I used to joke with my wife that, you know, she needed arm extenders because it was getting, <laughs> it's like, a, you know, six feet out. Uh, can you read that? Uh-huh, but I can't read up close. Um and so that's that's pretty common. Um, I've got macular degeneration, fairly mild, but that I've noticed that makes the the sharpness not as as good as it as it used to be. And um, and again, a lot of it's color combinations. Um, mm -hmm. Now now mind you, guys on the whole tend to be a little bit colorblind, as you probably know. Um, <laughs> I, I've gone shopping for suits. Go go in and buy a suit, and I ask the guy, I want a gray suit. The guy says, Got it, no problem. So I go off and get this gray suit. I go home. My wife goes, why'd you buy an olive suit? It's olive. I thought it was gray. The guy told me it was gray. He couldn't see it any better than I could. Um, so, so our, my olive suit was actually, so I, it was more of a military suit. So I guess it looked okay, but it was, it was not gray. Um, and a lot of guys just can't get those colors much more than right. women. Women are, are better at colors than, than men on the whole. They're much more sharp yeah, better cones and rods than we do. Is it colors or is it fashion sense? It's both. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will admit I'm not wearing my reading glasses today. So, although I'm, I was tempted to get them and bring them because of the size of the chat in the chat window, but ah. I'm just gonna. I'll see, if you see me sitting back like this, that's because I'm trying to read the comments. <laughs> Well, and that's that. I guess that's where there, where Rick brings old, me the, in. The old W3C site didn't follow their own principles, and she's absolutely right. Um, however, I have noticed that the WAI section of that site really does a good job at following the guidelines itself. So, so they're they're definitely improving. They're they're what do they call that? Eating your own dog food, <laughs> right? So when we when we talked, you had a. Uh, we were kind of putting together the the show today and and you and I were talking about some of the success stories that you had with with accessibility and I was hoping you can share share that story with uh, with our group today sure um, I taught was teaching an instructional systems class actually and it was a live and in person class that was blended so it was um, it was sort of half online and half in, in residence and I had a completely visually blind student in that course. Now, when you think about that, the course was actually called Multimedia Design for Instruction. So if you think about that, there was a video project that was a really big part of, you know, what she had to do uh, for this course. It was, a, it was a major project. But, you know, she and I worked together. We came up with an alternate assignment for her. And actually what we did was in her team, we had her do what she was good at. She did the audio work and she hmm. was able to do that really, really well. And they relied on her for that. And she relied on them to do the video editing because clearly she was not going to be able to do it. So, um, I think we were, we were discussing the, the fact that, you know, in higher ed and in, in, in corporate training environments as well, I would imagine you want the students to come out with certain objectives being met. And if they can't participate in an activity that is going to help them to meet that objective, it's really important to find something else that they can do that will get them to the same place. So, I mean, I thought she was really great at working with me and giving me a heads up when something wasn't working. Um, one of the challenges is that our course management system that we use at our institution isn't terribly accessible. She had a difficult time 
uh, in some ways because she could not send an email from within the course management system. So we had to find alternate ways around that. And that that was a little surprising and telling to me. I had There's a 508 button in our course management system that you're supposed to be able to turn on so that it so that it acts in accordance with 508 and it it just wasn't there yet you know the technology just wasn't there so that was a shame well it's interesting because uh, i know we've done a lot of work with adobe captivate and when you do closed captioning it's a teeny weeny little cc button <laughs> and I, was, I always laugh i go now who's that actually geared for <laughs> yeah because if somebody is actually visually impaired they'd have a hard time seeing that little cc button right just sort of funny yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. There's nothing wrong but, with Fisher Price interfaces. <laughs> well, and again, you know, as long as there's a keyboard shortcut that will get them there, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's not a problem. But if there isn't, then yeah, th that's going to be an issue. Yep. So. And it makes a it makes a lot of sense what you had said earlier about if we think about these things as we're designing the course, it's probably a lot more economical, cost effective. And just validates the learning even more to start building it with accessibility in mind. Even if the course goes live and uh, somebody, uh, you know, no one ever needs the accessibility features of it, it's still uh, sound financial planning and sound um, <coughs> instructional design to, to actually start building with uh, accessibility. Uh, they in mind. Also, right. They also show that it, it tends to be more cost effective. Things uh, that are designed with accessibility in mind up front and usability are generally less trouble to maintain if you're maintaining something over time. Um, it's easier to, it, so that costs less money. And then if you do come across someone, I, you know, I imagine if I were someone who really needed that keyboard input, for example, let's say I just couldn't use a mouse. If I came across a site that it, that it was clear that they had designed it so that I could have a sensible experience, you know, I become loyal to those to those folks, mm -hmm. you know, for for even just thinking about it ahead of time. And also, it reduces the amount of support calls. That, that's another thing that that people don't really factor into the development. How often do whether it's e-learning, whether it's um, it's an ATM out there in the uh, in the wilderness, how many support calls are you going to get because people can't figure it out? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's no, amazing how, how, how hard some of the computer interfaces are for people. They're confusing for a lot of people. Well, we design them for us, not, mm -hmm. for, right. not for them, right? So, you know, the story I like to tell my uh, introductory students is um, <clears throat> my, my mother-in-law got a computer. She had it for about six months. And so she got email. We were very excited. We were going to send her pictures of the kids and all this stuff. And uh, about a month later, we get this package in the mail. It's one of those brown envelopes right and it's like this thick and we open it up and we pull out this thick stack of paper and she has printed off every email joke people had <laughs> sent to her and mailed it to us <laughs> so <laughs> when i design anything i try to design it so that its purpose is utterly clear i picture her in my mind <laughs> this is who i'm designing for i'm not designing for me i mean it was the best lesson I could have gotten in your users are not you. <laughs> now, we got my mama a little Mac Mini once because she wanted to do more emailing and so bring it in, set it up. It's fairly easy. Set up her her Firefox because she liked Firefox over Safari. Mm -hmm. So we set it up and she goes, it's not Windows. No, <laughs> it, it's a Mac. It's not Windows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, it's a little different. I don't get it. Well, you haven't even tried. <laughs> By the time we, six months later, it was my Mac Mini that we put in the office and eventually sold and gave her a Windows machine. Now she's happy to do right. two well, things, funny. email yeah. and, and surfing. That's it. It's not, it's not even that, and I'm not saying anything about Windows interface at all because I have Windows 7 and it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've noticed is, is when you're talking about user interfaces, we've had a couple of internal systems that we've used here where the user interfaces were horrible. And once people learn them, it's harder to change them. Right. You know, so once people adjust to a bad interface, it's almost worse to improve it because they've already learned it. So well, well also I think I think my mom was typical of the Mac is no easier than Windows if you really think about it. It's kind yeah. of a myth. If you take somebody who doesn't really know computers that well and put them on a Mac or put them on Windows, I'm not sure what they'll be better at. I think it's probably 50-50. 
I, I would I would agree with that. I would I would think that that could be the case. Yeah. I think once you, you get used to the interface, I don't know if you'd find anybody like that. I don't know. <laughs> I could send you to my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> She'll get along fine with my mom. <laughs> <laughs> they can send each other packages back and forth. <laughs> yeah, really. You know, jokes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let let's shift gears here. And uh, Rick and I were kind of playing around with um, one of the things you, you had told us that you wanted to talk about, the um, open attribute. And we're shifting from 508 over to um, Creative Commons. And we, we were trying to we, – we see some, some potential. Well, I, I, I don't want to speak for you, Rick, so I'll just say I, I see some potential in the open attribute. But I see some, some challenges there too. So since you wanted us to talk about this, let me give you an opportunity here to kind of set up what, what open attribute is and um, you know, how you're using it. And just to preface it, neither of us could get it to work. So we don't know if we were oh, doing really? something wrong or right uh, or we were on the wrong websites maybe. That's interesting. Okay, so open attribute – is a browser plugin and it works in Firefox, Opera, and Chrome. Yes, that's it. And also there's a Drupal and a WordPress plugin. And what it essentially does is it um, it in the address bar of the of the URL that you are on, if the content there is Creative Commons licensed and that Creative Commons has the the machine readable license on there. It reads the page, and right in your right-hand side of the address bar of your browser, it will put a little, either a CC logo in uh, Firefox's case, or it's a, it looks a little different in Chrome. And what you can do from there, um, and I use it in Firefox because I personally like how it works a little bit better in Firefox, um, you can pull, click on that, and it gives you a drop-down where you can copy the attribution either as plain text or as HTML. Mm. And so when I'm getting images, we, we like to use Creative Commons licensed stuff in our courses. It's a lot more cost effective. Um, people, there's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of places to go to get Creative Commons licensed, you know, images, media, sounds. So I use that and I, I pull the item down, I copy from open attribute, and then I just go right into the code and paste that code directly in there, and then I know it's cited appropriately when okay. I go forward. I think what so, we were getting is, at least I was getting, a, this website is not supplying information or ID or something like that, so it didn't so seem it, to know what to do with it. It requires that, the, I'm sorry, I had a little jiggle there. <laughs> um, <laughs> It requires that the content have the appropriate Creative Commons code on the page. Okay. So if you go to Flickr uh, and find a Creative Commons licensed image, I, I often use the flickr.com slash search slash advanced. Okay. And then if you do a search term and then below tell it to only search within Creative Commons licensed content, when you are on the photo page, it should give you that bar and that chance to copy the attribution. That's generally how I've used it. I actually haven't had any problems using it. Um, it has saved me immense amounts of time. Okay, I think I know what I did. I, I just went to the Flickr homepage and typed it and nothing happened because I wasn't looking at any images. Right, you need to be on a page that has images. an image that is licensed. Got it, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's to me it's a time saver because A, I know I'm citing it appropriately. B, I don't have to do any of the code. C, it includes the links to the license. It includes the links to the original image. It includes the appropriate credit line for the person. So there's none of that searching around, well, what's their username and who do I say this is attributed to and where do I link back to? Um, I've really found it to be really useful. I guess we're we're going to have to go back in and, and play with it some more, Rick. Yeah, because yeah, uh, we, we failed, failed our first, first attempt. attempt. Yes, we did, miserably. I'm sorry. We're not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and it doesn't just work on images either. I mean, it would work on anything that is online that is Creative Commons licensed. So we recently changed the footer, our course footers. Uh, we have open educational resources. Uh, the Dutton Institute offers a lot of our courses as OERs. So we have an open ed site with courses that people can go in and look at and use for their own edification or for whatever. Um, on this website and our licenses weren't technically showing up because we didn't have the right code on the pages. 
So we went back, we corrected the code, and, and so now anyone who uses our stuff, Open Attribute definitely works with it. We, we made sure that that change happened. That's mm. great. Now, what, what sites do you recommend to get um, good, good graphics that have already been uh, cleared, if you will? Right. Well, Creative Commons, um, you can search Creative Commons licensed content directly from Firefox. Uh, if you, you know the little search bar that's in the upper mm -hmm. right hand corner of your browser? Yeah. There's a, that's actually a drop down and you can choose, usually it's set to Google or something, but if you drop down, it'll, it'll give you a selection that you can search Creative Commons. Oh, interesting. Um, so you can search from right within your browser if you're in Firefox. I actually don't tend to use that as much. Um, usually I know what I'm looking for. It might depend on, you know, is it a course on water quality? Is it a, a technical course on, you know, plastics engineering? What do, what do I need? If I need something that's going to be more like a photo or an example of something, I generally start with Flickr's advanced search. And that's just flickr.com slash search slash advanced. And then again, clicking the Creative Commons uh, box at the bottom. That's where I get a good number of my photos. Okay. Now, um, that, now that brings up an interesting question because Flickr has been slowly dying out and everybody's been moving towards Facebook. Toward Picasa? Can, yeah, or that, yeah. Can you actually, I guess you can search Facebook for images. I never even tried. Um, I'm not sure that's an easy thing to do. Yeah, it, it's not. And I don't know that they have the licensing ability on there. They probably um, don't. They do on YouTube. So you can search okay. YouTube, you put in a search term, and then you can narrow your search results based on whether or not it's Creative Commons. So you can find Creative Commons videos that way? Yes, you can find Creative Commons videos in YouTube. So you do your search, and then you click the little box that narrows it down. Okay. So that's, that's kind of a really, really cool thing. Um, for images that are more technical in nature, so let's say I need a diagram of a caffeine molecule, just as an example. Um, I go to they're all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I go to Wikimedia Commons. So it's commons.wikimedia.org. And it's just a place for people. And it's got photos as well. But it's also got a lot of sort of more scientific-y kind of things on there. So you can find, you know, weather graphs that people have put up. And some of these will be either Creative Commons. They'll be GNU licensed. Or they will be, uh, they, some people even release things into the public domain, which means you don't need to cite them at all. So for more technical stuff, I like Wikimedia Commons. Um, for images and graphics of, of those kinds of things, diagrams, I, I usually start there. For sound, I usually go to Jamendo if I need music. It's J-A-M-E-N-D-O dot com, Jamendo. Um, they have Creative Commons licensed music. A lot of it is very good. The artists release it up there, and you can um, use it for certain purposes and use the Creative Commons licensing. And if you want to do a commercial thing with it, they have a very easy interface where you can pay the artist a certain amount to use it for a certain purpose. So there's a little form you fill out, um, and then you basically have purchased the rights. I like to think of it as a, uh, a fair trade mm -hmm. <laughs> copyright uh, system. So it's like the artist is getting you know, most, if not all, of the money that you're giving them to use the piece. And it's generally a lot cheaper than going through regular channels. Right, to get that which can get pretty expensive. Yeah, yeah. So Jamendo yeah. is really good for, for music. And then sounds, I usually go to uh, freesound. Dot, dot, I think it's dot .org. Um, Jamendo is J-A-M-E-N-D-O, I think, Dawn. I don't know if you're getting there through the U or not. She's got the link in the window, so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, but, Terrence, uh, Terrence, anything happening in the chat room today? Uh, well, just Dawn's doing a great job recapping all the uh, all the websites. So <laughs> thank you, Dawn, thank for, you, Dawn. for doing that. Yeah. Um, and we have a, a few comments, but no no questions uh, in there. And welcome, Jenna. Jenna from Topics jumped into the uh, into the the chat um, Very cool. a little bit ago. So welcome. Uh, but I guess Larry has one that says you can upload your YouTube and tell it to use standard YouTube licensing, or you can use a CC license. Right. So YouTube you can when you're license uploading. your stuff when you put it on YouTube, and then you can find things by searching and then narrowing your search results to look for the, only those things uh, that are Creative Commons licensed. 
which is which is kind of nice too, and, a re- and makes it much easier. That's fairly recent, I think, that they've added that. It, it is. I think it's only been in the last six months. I'm not right. sure if it's been a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if it has been or not. So those are a couple of really really good things. Uh, other stuff that I like to show when I'm talking about you know sort of free and open sourcey kinds of tools, and this is going to fall more under free than the open source Creative Commons stuff, is there are a lot of sites out there that will allow you to do things for your you know, do activities in training or do things if you're teaching and doing teaching and learning for students that are free, even if they're not open source. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's just so much out there. It's hard to keep up actually. Oh, that's good. I have a question for you, Stevie. Yeah. We're going to put you on the spot. Oh, oh great. What's your top, <laughs> what's a prediction you have for e-learning in the future? Oh, wow. Any prediction? Any prediction. Um, I actually think, um, and I think about this a lot with in terms of higher education. So let me let me. I'll answer. I'll answer twice if that's okay. Sure. Once for what I think we're going to be doing a little bit more of in the corporate environment because I am totally not as familiar with that. So you guys can all make fun of my answer. And then <laughs> once in the higher education environment, I think in higher education we're going to be doing a lot more lessons from informal learning. Um, Things are going to be more uh, facilitative between the instructor and the students. Lecturing is becoming quite uncommon. Hmm. Uh, and you know, having students do rather than just listen is becoming more of the model that, that we're using. Uh, so I think that that's that lessons from informal learning, which is you know, just in time, it's student directed, you know, it's what they want to know. And I think to some extent, you know, we may be doing that in the training realm as well. I think um, Training's difficult because there are the the objectives to, to me from as an outside perspective tend to be I don't want to say clearer because I don't think that expresses what I mean. Um, you know what you need to do. You need to get someone to be able to use this system. You need to build soft skills training, right? You need to do this or that. Whereas, you know, if I'm working on a liberal arts course, I want them to appreciate the idea of sustainability, maybe. And to me, that's a little bit fuzzier but maybe looser as well so that's it that's all i got guys <laughs> and what about the corporate <laughs> well that was the corporate oh that was the corporate the, I mean, the looser okay we take lessons from informal learning too but you know probably more mobile stuff um my guess is that corporate will get to mobile before higher education does that's interesting it probably will yeah I, at, I at least in certain in certain areas right Right now, corporate, you know, mobile is the buzzword. So the, the herd is all kind of racing that way. And then, you know, we'll see what next the next buzzword is. Um, because mobile is great, but it doesn't apply to all situations. Right. And yeah. you've got to decide what makes sense to offer that way. Yep. Right? Yep. Uh, Tapia, we'll I think I'm saying that right, said, I'd like to see lectures like this in the future for higher ed live video and chat feeds. And I will say that I actually am working on a course where it's on energy and the environment um, and the instructor happens to know a lot of folks in industry, so we're going to be setting up something like this. And in fact, I contacted Terrence to ask him about how you guys had worked this, because she wants to do a sort of a live interview with a guest lecturer, um, and it'll be recorded, much like this is, kind of right. a conversation between right. the two of them. And then they'll discuss uh, for the rest of the week with the students in the discussion board. And the easiest and cheapest way to do this is we've, we've invested a lot of time, effort, and money into equipment. And you don't need all that if you're just doing a one-on-one interview. Skype. You right. can record Skype. There's yeah. tools like VODBurner, V-O-D-B-U-R-N-E-R, VODBurner.com, which will take video, which will record your Skype video, will record all of your audio, and that allows you to edit it and actually do your switching of people. And it's it's really a cool tool because it switches between the actual cameras, oh, if you nice. will. Uh, and it's it's free or something like 12 bucks a month. It's not very expensive at all. Okay. Um, and the, the company out of Australia, they did a really nice job with that one. That's probably so the you, best one on Skype. See, I don't I don't like VOD Burner as much, Rick. I, I like Super Tintin. Okay, that's another one. Yeah, it... it because it gives you four tracks, so it lets you pull apart the tracks, even though you can do that in, in your editing software, too. But I was finding some codec issues with VODBurner. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. But, um, again, that might be me. I'm, um, you know, the, the version of Vegas I was using is a lot lower, you know, than, than the version you were you were using. I was using 8. I think you're on 10, It's on right? 10, yep. Yeah, so that, that could be part of the issue. I'll have to try it in, in Premiere. I'm going to have to drag you up into the, to the, to the future. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> well, the, you know, the problem with that is I have Premiere. Um, You've got so the Master like, Collection. Do I, yeah, do you've I got really it all. Wanna, huh? You've got the Master Collection. You've got it all. I know, I know. So do I really want to, you know, spend to upgrade Vegas? But that's for another show and when we talk about multimedia, I guess. Right. Yeah. Well, I, it was interesting. I was just looking in the comment uh, chat window and, uh, you know, someone was saying corporations may get to mobile officially, but younger generations in college will do will do it on their own. And I agree. They do a lot of things on their own now. Uh, one of the interesting things that I've found is instead of using the course management system for the student groups to use to do virtual meetings, they're creating Facebook groups. They're using Google Documents. Um, and they're doing all that stuff on their own without their instructor's knowledge or whatever. And the only people that really get nervous about that are the ones who are like, well, I, I need to have control over it or I need to see right. it. Most folks are like, you know, what, however your group wants to meet, just meet, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. My, my, uh, my daughter is going to UOP, University of Phoenix, online, and they're going through the same thing. They, they set up their groups. They have an official group, but I think they set separate groups up where they do other study sessions and places to collaborate. So you're right. There's kind of a multi-track approach right. to, to a mobile learning, if you will. And uh, it seems to work pretty well. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I, I think the students are going to lead the way. Or hit a wall. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> not quite sure which sometimes. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I think the more we... we teach them about instructional design too as a competency I think then the content starts to become a lot clearer to us as well because when you look on YouTube there's some great knowledge sharing that goes on but if, if only they had a little bit more knowledge about how to you know how to how to uh, you know chunk it or how to do a, a more solid performance objective or better taxonomy you know right. that that could have been even better so I, I think that you know the in dismissing instructional design is probably a bad thing, but saying that, you know, everybody understands how to design instruction and then let us go into this social learning uh, uh, realm, I think that just makes it even better. Right. But we, our philosophy here is to teach them to fish as much as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. sure. um, usually, you know, the faculty member really, it's their course, you know, so I shouldn't be in there messing around with it as, too much. So if, if I can teach someone to fish and be able to do the stuff themselves that's that's better for all of us and it increases our capacity as well sure that sounds great so it's it's kind of interesting well, Steve, yeah. we are just about at the end of the show are we but we try not to torture awesome. the guests too much <laughs> yeah. no, this isn't well, torture at all that. this is great stevie <laughs> actually this is really good this is very yeah. informative and we'd love to have you back on again and, and share more stuff actually what we'd like to do in the future is also maybe have you have you show some samples of of courses that you've created or things like that which would be great for people to get ideas sure sure i'd be happy to and uh, next next week we are dark, um, and that's just to uh, celebrate the Fourth of July, um, which is that the show is on the fifth. But uh, we're going to go dark that week anyway, since so many people are on vacation and things like that. Uh, I'll be out of town as well, and Rick will be hungover from Monday. So, <laughs> I don't, I don't, <laughs> but the week, I don't, I don't drink, but. but Hot dogs and hot dogs and burgers could do that. <laughs> they they definitely can, especially hot dogs. Like you, you do an all you can eat hot dog, and uh, you know I think you will be hungover from something. Well, you know it's funny. I, I had a friend who worked at a hot dog place when I was a kid, and we ate so many hot dogs. I don't really eat that many anymore. <laughs> I think getting sick cured me of that one. <laughs> and the uh, the week after we have. Um, Oh gosh, you know what? I, I don't remember if it was Alicia Sanchez. It or is. It is Alicia. Uh, I believe it's Alicia. It's Alicia. Okay, great. Because I know we have Anders uh, in there too. So Alicia Sanchez, she unveiled a uh, mobile game at um, MLearn conference last week, and uh, we get to do a follow up with her on that, and that will be uh, that will be great. And she is games G A M E S Czar C Z A R on Twitter, so you can definitely. Uh, uh, tweet her and find out what she's going to unveil for us uh, during eLearn Chat. And Stevie, again, thank you very much. Molto bene. Very good. <laughs> yep. Thank you. And we'll have this on uh, Justin, not Justin TV. We'll have this it on, will be uh, on, um, Vimeo. on Vimeo a little bit later today. 
So we'll post out the links on 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 uh, Twitter, and I think Terrence puts them out on Facebook. I put them out on Facebook. So we'll we'll get the links out there. So you'll you'll see the uh, the show, uh, the recorded show. Yep. Thanks so much, Davey. All right. Thank, thank you, you, and thanks everybody who's watching. And we'll see you guys next week. Take care. Bye.